Welcome to Recently Logged, where this week, Wonk is going to open up his factory. He's going to let people in. Hello. Hello. I almost said, <laughs> I almost said it at the same time you did. <laughs> but here we are. We're back. We're back again. A Another dinosaur week. story. And, uh, no. <laughs> I thought we did that bit last week, or maybe it was oh, two weeks ago. Okay. It's a repeated bit of my repeated life. Bit. Wow, it's a it's a motif in your. Life. <laughs> Anytime I hear somebody say we're back, we're I back. think a dinosaur story. So it's quite funny. But yes, here we are. I'm Robbie, and I'm Micah, and we're talking about movies again. If you can even believe it, Man, we seem to do that a lot. <laughs> we, we, need to to, we need to a get a, a new bit, a new a, a new, new stick. What's what's up with that? <laughs> It's all just movie, movie, movie. It's almost like recently logged as a movie review podcast. Whoa. Who would have thought it? That would be pretty revolutionary. <laughs> there's never been any of there's those. Never, there's never been a single movie review podcast done by two white guys. It's yeah. never happened before. <laughs> we're, we're just that revolutionary. Just that revolutionary. Just that daring. Exactly. <laughs> Speaking of daring, Micah, and revolution. Oh, really? Were you, that's our segue. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you, you could. You could. I would say daring. I wouldn't say revolutionary necessarily. But uh, <laughs> we're talking about a movie that some may call daring this week. <laughs> I don't know anybody would call this daring, but yeah. I, I would call it a daring production. I don't know if I'd call it a daring <laughs> movie, you know? <laughs> we're talking about Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The 1971 picture. Ooh. Just cult a, classic. I was about to say, most people do know the difference between Willy Wonka and Charlie and the... Mm-hmm. But still, I gotta, gotta specify that it's the 70s it one. It is the 70s one. not everyone knows that. It, I don't know. The, the legacy of this movie is is kind of strange because it is a cult movie like a cult classic by definition yeah. just because it severely underperformed and then through like tv network showings of it it slowly grew like a very a very strong cultural very strong presence. cultural presence exactly until it's re-released in the 90s and then like yeah obviously a bunch of people love it now including us including us wow we grew up with it <laughs> I, I was about to say i made a list of movies i watched like in my childhood and this is like top of the list. <laughs> we watched this a lot we watched this one so many times when we were young so which you know good for us i was about to say we had a, taste it's a great movie it's probably the reason uh <laughs> micah loves 70s movies so much probably and i mean i like 70s movies too i'm just not it, it, it seems to pale in, in comparison it's my, it's, to your it's love definitely my favorite decade of movies there you go but yeah, let's let's tell the people a little more about Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Let's. All right. Uh, again, we're talking about Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which is a 1971 movie. There they just go. said that, but I'm going to say did. it again. We just said it like I think like three <laughs> times in the intro. Uh, it is rated G. It's an hour and 40 minutes. This little IMDb description reads, A poor but hopeful boy seeks one of five coveted golden tickets that will send him on a tour of Willy Wonka's mysterious chocolate factory. Well, that's like the, that's like the first act. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like what the movie is about. I mean, yeah, right? yeah, it's true. The cast features Gene Wilder, uh, Jack Albertston, nice. uh, Peter Ostrom, <laughs> Roy Kinnear, there you go. Julie Don Cole. Nice. Leonard Stone. And, you know, it's a big cast. And, uh, there's, there's more people. It's a big ensemble yeah. movie if there ever was one, you know. Not that it's, like, big, but, like, it's definitely an ensemble movie. Directed by Mel Stewart. Mel Stewart. Which is a good name. I like the name Mel Stewart. It sounds made up. <laughs> Mel Stewart, of course. Uh, written by Roald Dahl and David Seltzer. Very nice. It was nominated for one Oscar. Uh, for best music, scoring, adaptation, and original song score. Hmm. Uh, did not win. I don't know what it <laughs> lost to. <laughs> hey, but I mean, the music is quite good. I can't, I can't complain. Right? No, I'm glad it got, like, it's kind of goofy, but I'm glad it got <laughs> Oscar recogni recognition. It's, yeah, it seems silly that, like, <laughs> the Quaker ad movie got an Oscar <laughs> nomination. <laughs> You got a, the the Nestle ad. Right? The Nestle ad, yeah, it's a it's a long Nestle ad with uh, Gene Wilder in it. 
Which hey, I mean, and it's a musical. <laughs> uh, trying to think of anything else interesting. I don't know. I I think the fact that it did get a lot of funding from uh, Quaker is very funny. I don't know why I find that so funny. I mean, I don't know why you do either. <laughs> Just because I think Quaker, I think like oats, and I'm like, this is an but oat Ruby, movie. Ruby, you're thinking too broad here. Don't think. I know Quaker. it's Nestle. I know think it's Nestle. Nestle because you see, it was not Quaker directly. <laughs> it was. A sub company, a know. subsidiary, if you will, of Quaker. I know. Known as Nestle. It's just now in my mind, Micah, now that I know this, it's cursed knowledge because, <laughs> because I think Willy Wonka and I'm like, it's an oat movie. Oh, well, Ravi, you could be like, I think Yoohoo and I think oats. Oats. It's true. <laughs> I think you're just, I think you're just, you're not understanding the scope of which things Quaker owns. I think it's quite funny, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that I guess that is an interesting thing. So many of you uh, probably know, especially people who were not born in like that are not a like a Alive. formed person who has oh. memories <laughs> uh, pre nineteen seventy one. Ah, yes. Uh, but that that Wonka candy that you probably know of, mostly Gobstoppers. Yeah, there's I think. the the everlasting Gobstoppers, mm-hmm. and there I, are. I don't know what. Else. It's, uh, there's something. Did there's they ever? Other did candies. they ever make like a chocolate? They, yeah. Okay. Apparently, they started with a chocolate bar. Okay. And there were several other candies, and I even know there have been other candies yeah. in our lifetime. In in my life, oh, I guess runts are Wonka runts, too. Yeah. Um, so there there are various stuff, but all of that Wonka candy <laughs> was made in part with the deal for the like film rights. <laughs> That's crazy. Of this movie, <laughs> so as part of you're making a Willy Wonka film. They also, Nestle wanted to make yeah. Willy Wonka tie-in candy. Um, <laughs> Which is pretty cool, because the movie got funding, and they got, like, an awesome candy. <laughs> you're right. And then they, and it's kind of goofy to me that that candy is still being made today. Like, it's, <laughs> Willy Wonka is not, like, the most relevant thing in the world, but there's still Wonka candy out there. Kicking. Right. I was about to say, we just had some gobstoppers, I don't know, like a couple weeks ago. Yeah, just in general, Good the fact stuff. that there's Wonka candy is so cool. <laughs> I As as a Roll Doll fan, I think it's very cool. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much, you know, the basic facts of Willy Wonka. So Indeed. I suppose we'll, now we'll get into our opinions on the movie. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I only like fact based like podcasts. Fact based podcasts. You just read the Wikipedia page for it. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> no, you gotta paraphrase the Wikipedia page. Gotta add some flourish to it exactly. and make it your own. It's gonna be our new podcast, <laughs> just reading the entire Wikipedia page. You know, I think I think there are podcasts out there that just read Wikipedia pages <laughs> and people listen to it. I mean why I can't not? blame them. I'd I do it. Yeah. It's <laughs> Anyway, let's get into it. <laughs> so, Ravi. Yes. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who can really say what their thoughts are, you know? Well, <laughs> how can are, one hey, measure it? Well, thought? how about with us? We'll condense that down and make it a little bit of an easier oh, question. Okay. okay. What are your thoughts? On Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the thing this podcast is about. Wow. I, well, that is a bit easier to answer. <laughs> um, I, I mean, as we mentioned, we watched this like a bunch of times when we were younger. So I feel I want to say that my judgment of the movie isn't clouded by nostalgia, but I feel like that's <laughs> terribly ignorant to say that. <laughs> um, yeah. But I do think it is a fantastic movie. Um, obviously, a lot of people praise Gene Wilder's performance, but I think the whole ensemble is really funny and really great. Um, especially the kids. I'm sur- I'm always surprised at how good the kids' performances are. Um, obviously, some like I don't know, like Mike TV are a little weaker, um, but they're not bad by any stretch. Like the whole ensemble is really solid. Yeah. Um, I love the production design. That's one of the standout things that I always remember about this movie is it's um, just general art direction and the way it captures the vibe of the book in a very tangible way, um, which I figured we'd probably discuss this kind of in the framing as a Roald Dahl adaptation also, since there are a bunch of other Roald Dahl movies <laughs> out there, um, which we've covered one on the podcast before. But... I, I think in general, I just think it's a 
phenomenally magical movie, if that makes any sense. I mean, Indeed. like the score is beautiful and it just kind of it kind of wraps you in a warm blanket, you know, for like the whole movie. <laughs> And it's it's a really fun ride. I don't know. It's a, it's really funny. It's really fun, and it's almost always interesting. So, I I really enjoy it. I gave it a five out of five. Nice. What nice. about you, Micah? What do you think of the movie? Well, also, <laughs> raging nostalgia. I was about fueled. to say. I, I feel like if I, if any movie were clouded by nostalgia, <laughs> it would be this one. <laughs> right. Uh, but I absolutely love this movie. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, and I mean, yeah, I yeah. agree with most things you said about it. I think this movie is is literally just magical to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, it does such a perfect job of capturing the spirit of a lot of the messages and themes of Roald Dahl books. Mm-hmm. Um, and oh, it yeah, does I didn't it even with, mention that. <laughs> it does it with absolutely fantastic, like, uh, an absolutely fantastic sense of, like, uh, what, is, what is a good word for it? Like just a certain something grandioseness. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. Like it, like it, a majesty. Almost. Yeah, that's not quite right either. I the suppose. cast really brings <laughs> so much great energy to it. Gene Wilder is obviously amazing in this role. I forgot how many uh, fun line readings there were from the parents. <laughs> the parent, yeah, the parents are great. The kids are really fun. Yeah, like everything about this movie, including especially a lot of its sets and direction, are just so engaging and interesting while always being able to take their time (laughs) Um, one of the things that i really love about specifically 70s movies is that they are one of since the film industry especially was kind of in a really really bad place in the 70s money wise most of the movies that came out in the 70s are extremely inventive. And, well, they had to be, yeah. Yeah, they had to be. And they also utilize atmosphere like nobody else because, <laughs> again, they, they they only had so much they could use. Right. So they used a lot of it to cultivate a lot of specific atmosphere that kind of carries the film. Yeah, And this has such a does. tangible atmosphere. Even though the sets are low budget and you can tell things are, like, kind of wonky <laughs> wow <Wonky. laughs> who'd have thought but it's really just it's <laughs> such a like a rich movie right no it's man it's a beautiful movie i i, I it really struck me this time like just how amazingly rich it feels even though you can tell how cheap a lot of the stuff in it is right and like even even Which, just, I mean that's good lighting. Let me tell even you. <laughs> even just the messages yeah. of this movie, the way they pull off the fact that they again do one of a very roll doll message, very roll doll, um, and they pull it off in a way that just feels so like like good you're like yeah, which yeah. is very difficult to translate. It's very hard from to his do. books. Yeah, there's a there's a plethora of bad roll doll movies out there but uh i gave this a five out of five very nice and again one of my favorite movies <laughs> i mean i i made a um top 250 of all time lists um recently and this was an easy addition to that <laughs> again childhood classic right like, i can't avoid it <laughs> but yeah i actually wanted to uh continue that line okay. of thought because i think I, I think i just interrupted you mid thought anyway but we were kind of getting off topic from oh like yeah small opinion <laughs> yeah yeah uh but in terms of uh like roll doll adaptations Ruby, what do you think of this i think um you know there there's i, I really enjoy roll dolls books is it it's just a given fact. <laughs> um, I mean, Fantastic Mr. Fox is one of my favorite movies, and I think is probably the only Roll Doll adaptation that might edge this one out as like a better movie. Um, and both of those movies, both Willy Wonka and uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, make changes to the text to help adapt it to a, you know, a longer form movie. Um, which it's interesting because with Willy Wonka, they don't really like change that much, quote unquote. I know Roald Dahl was upset with what they did change. Well, uh, according but, to what I've found in my research, he was he was really upset with small things. Here yeah, and there. exactly. He didn't like he didn't like the score or the music. Mm-hmm. He thought it was too, too emotional. Yeah, too like sentimental. Um, and he didn't like Gene Wilder because he thought he was too pretentious. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. And like, I don't know, as an adaptation of the book itself, though, it manages to capture a lot of the kind of frenzy energy that yeah, happens in the I book. I think I think honestly, though, one of my favorite elements of the atmosphere of the movie comes from those two things that Roald Dahl didn't like about <laughs> right? it. Um, 
because Gene Wilder brings, yes, a pretentious kind of feeling to the role, but in kind of a mysterious way, especially in a movie like this. Yeah. He brings so much of that energy that you don't really know what he's doing. He seems <laughs> like he's a step ahead of like everyone else. Exactly. No, um, it, and that's definitely to the movie's benefit. And that paired with its over, like, its abundance of over, like, sentimentality. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um allows you to kind of get into the melodrama of the movie right i was about to say i feel like i wouldn't buy this movie nearly as much if not for the like sweeping orchestral score and like fun musical numbers and everything I was about to say, there are some moments where like you can tell <laughs> that it is a little slow it's, it's yeah um i definitely think that's a side effect of of some of those song writing choices and gene wilder's performance choices but at the same time, I don't it's think marginal. those slow moments yeah. are even inherently bad. No, I like not just bad. sitting with those slow moments. Some of the some of the most fun moments of this movie to me are like just the kids like sitting around in a room for a while, you know? Yeah, I don't know. It <laughs> it gives the movie such a such a good sense of pace, in mm-hmm. my opinion, to have these slow moments because there there's really not that much that happens, <laughs> even though like like the chocolate factory like willy wonka and the chocolate factory it's one of the longer books from roald dahl it is that's it's Um, one of his longest books i think but in adapting it to a movie in this style story which is known now as just like how you adapt the book (laughs) right uh, it's not not that much happens yeah i mean plot wise there's not much there but there's so much that happens you know (laughs) yeah but like (laughs) plot wise so to adapt that and to translate that it's not just this breakneck speed kind of thing. No, I like how it almost feels like an odyssey, you know? Like, yeah. it's a it's a long, winding road more than, like, just a straight shot through the factory. When, especially with the budget that they had, mm-hmm. um, there's just not that many rooms, if you think about the <laughs> there's movie. There's really not. There's, like, eight or something. <laughs> <laughs> the factory doesn't seem that big, but they do a really they good job like cultivating through the atmosphere sprawling, and taking its yeah. time with each reveal an event to really make you feel like this factory could have anything behind any door exactly no and that's again partially because of the lighting and production design but also again because of the atmosphere and the way they paced out the story it's really brilliant i I think i i honestly can't imagine a better like movie version of charlie and the chocolate factory and we got one we got a different one that was and it's not as good it's it's more (laughs) book accurate accurate for all you book well, accurate see the thing people. is people the thing is about the book and a lot of real dolls books is they're about power dynamics between kids and adults mm. and the tim burton one really focuses on that and doesn't focus as much on like the moral tale stuff like this one does yeah um and it, i think it's worse off for it well not only that but if we if we went into it charlie and the chocolate factory the movie i think is fundamentally flawed it is as a movie <laughs> it, it, it's, it's it's actual emotional core and Willy Wonka as a character, in my opinion, from a writing level, are literally fundamentally flawed. It I find does it, not work. I find it very funny that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory features Willy Wonka as more of the main character than, than Willy, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate, Chocolate Factory. Factory. But Ravi, the book is called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Indeed. so we gotta have it called Charlie and the <laughs> Chocolate Factory. I, I was looking, I was trying to see why they changed the title, and apparently Charlie was, like, slang for a bunch of different, like, there was, like, a Vietnam-related slang thing <laughs> with, so they changed it. Yeah, that makes sense. And, like, a racial-related thing <laughs> with Charlie, I'm like, oh, no. It was the 70s, man. Yeah, it was the 70s, they, they had the Vietnam War and a bunch of racism, so they changed the title of the movie. <laughs> Now we have Willy Wonka. Now we have Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And and a distinct difference between Charlie and Willy Wonka, the two movies. You know, I heard Roald Dahl was upset with the fact that they made the Oompa Loompas like orange and green. Because they're originally supposed to be like African pygmies in the book, which is very strange. I was about to say, but listen, (laughs) I love Roald Dahl. I love Roald Dahl. But he is not... He's not the most the sensitive man when in the it world. Co- like, yeah, the most sensitive man when it comes to racial things. <laughs> when it comes to racial stuff, when it comes to 
really a lot of things. So, yeah. He's an old British author. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you know. I was about to say, even in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the original book, you get some more questionable mm, things. Some dicey stuff, yeah. <laughs> so that is a part of having to read his books, is you do get some, some very dated things from him. You know, I will say, um, again, I think... I actually prefer the story in this form over the book. I, I do like I the agree. book a lot. The book is not one of my the favorites from him. a lot different, um, yeah. and it's a lot slower than a lot of his books usually are. Yeah. Um, well, again, it's a lot longer, too. Mm-hmm. I honestly yeah. think it's one of his longest books. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting. I actually think I prefer the story in this form because they, they make it seem a lot more whimsical. Again, like they change a lot of the more eyebrow-raising elements <laughs> that are in the book. Um, to make it more wacky rather than like kind of darkish, you know? <laughs> yeah, and they do a good job of balancing the tone between it being kind of mm-hmm. dark and being really fun and no, whimsical. it's still it's still kind of a creepy on movie. a low budget. Yeah, on a low budget, <laughs> exactly. It's it's insanely Again, 70s, impressive. 70s movies. It's what's so special it's about crazy. them. Their limitations are what make them either sink or swim. So the ones we all know from the 70s, <laughs> they're phenomenal. They swam yeah. with such limitations that make them so good. It's crazy. It's so so good. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can like, like even even next to something like Fantastic Mr. Fox, mm-hmm. I think this is a quote unquote better adaptation in my opinion. Of his work. I don't know. It, it's a different kind Fantastic of Fantastic Mr. Fox just never really captures the spirit of Roald Dahl's work for me. It is a good adaptation. It's a good text adaptation. It, is a good it makes text a lot adaptation. of really good is, choices it when it comes great, to adapting the yeah. very short book. <laughs> I was about to say, Fantastic Mr. Fox is a short as heck book. The fact that they adapted it's like 12 it chapters into, or something. Into, and each chapter is like, and the fox did this. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a pretty, pretty brief book. So the fact that they adapted that into a very, very good, fantastic, practically perfect movie yeah. is great. But... I don't watch that movie and think of Roald Dahl. That's true. Um, again, I think something like Matilda captures the Roald Dahl spirit a lot more than Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah, does. Matilda, and I think Willy Wonka does a good job mm-hmm. at it too. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's, no, a, I mean, I, there's I a agree, good yeah. sense of in in Roald Dahl's work. You have a very good sense of Roald Dahl kind of not liking adults. Yeah, and really specifically trying to make books. In a way that, that kids books, children, yeah, I would yeah. say that empower children in a way that most kids books don't. Yeah, he tries to make a lot of messages and a lot of books where kids will like get revenge <laughs> on adults and like do stuff like that and like yeah. specifically saying like, oh look, these ugly mean adults are ugly and mean. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's pretty much every Roald Dahl book, it, except I don't know. There's a few outliers where he's, I mean, he's a, a very prolific author. Um, and obviously this is excluding his non-kids stuff. Yeah. Um, but he has a couple books that are about like romance and stuff. Like ECO Like Trot. ECO Trot. Yeah. There's a couple, there's like a handful that are like that. And, but anytime and, there's like a kid in the book. <laughs> and that's not even, that's boiling down like yeah. a broad theme of his books. That's obviously very, individual books have different themes that yeah. they play on. Like I mean, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. James and the Giant Peach is the same way. I mean, any, any of his really George's Marvelous books. Medicine. Yeah. Like that's just a writing style that he brings, which was which is a really cool thing to read as a child. It feels mm-hmm. very special. It feels very interesting to read as a child. Absolutely. Um, and I think this movie does a great job of bringing that feeling to life in a really like unique and not cartoonishly stupid way. I think honestly, that's the most baffling part of this movie is that like i i was thinking about like because I, I never really thought about it much when i was watching it as a kid but i was thinking about like what is what is the movie trying to give you like to take away from it and it's really just like you know bad parenting leads to bad kids, yeah bad parenting usually. bad kids but also like you know believe in your dream you know (laughs) and like it it'll probably it might happen you know (laughs) yeah it's crazy (laughs) again it's roald dahl loves rewarding like exactly people i was about to say he loves rewarding good deeds this movie (laughs) is really really fun on a on a theme level because you have all of these bad parents that lead to these 
bad kids yeah and they're just bad and annoying i was about to say I, it's so refreshing to see just like a straight up moral tale and then because i was trying to think of anything else you could really take as, from this. As, then you have charlie who has his mom who genuinely cares about mm -hmm. him and he's grown up without much but a really kind heart right um and that leads him to again according to kind of the movie's meta like deserve the ticket more than exactly the rest of them. yeah and and he has a higher chance of getting it because he wants it more exactly yeah the whole yeah i was about to say the they say he wants it more like four times in the movie <laughs> <laughs> probably more than that yeah but it's very it's very just it's a, it's written in such a way and presented in such a way where that could be really stupid and again cartoonish <laughs> and annoying yeah or you could completely write out you know the emotional core of charlie's family in some kind of right. weird tim burton adaptation oh my gosh um, dude but <laughs> it really leads to something really special when you get to that ending scene in the glass elevator every single time when he's like that line with the whole you know what happened to the man who suddenly oh. got everything he ever wanted <laughs> he lived happily, he lived ever, happily after. ever after that line i swear is is cheesy as heck but it's killer <laughs> in the movie i love that line well it's it's the it's the fulfillment of everything that the movie's been laying down which seems like in in a modern landscape of children's movies it seems absolutely ridiculous i was about to say it's it's telling the kids directly not even just charlie but the kids who are watching the movie having specifically now dreams about Flights elaborate fancy, yeah. elaborate factories and chocolate and candy it is telling them directly that if they are kind at heart and believe enough their dreams, their dreams can will come, come true. true exactly yeah and that, and that like and that's cool <laughs> that's crazy it's cool in the in the cynical landscape of movies nowadays that seems outright ridiculous <laughs> you know but i man it just works so well in this movie it's crazy <laughs> uh do you have any questions though i have any questions that was kind of that was kind of a big one on the roll doll <laughs> adaptation section yeah yeah um I don't know. I, we mentioned how great the cast is. Do you have any like favorite standout performances that you'd like um, to shout well, out? You know, if we get to the cast, there's you could talk a lot about <laughs> the very. There's some interesting the performances about about this movie. Yeah. Um, because like you have this casting and it feels so like it feels so just like cheap almost. <laughs> like half of these people feel like just normal people just normal people yeah. and like bit actors or something you know like it's it's a Dude, very weird so many of the parents feel like we're cultivated actors. from this <laughs> yeah but in the best way possible um, it's good direction let me tell you i really i've always loved um grandpa joe's performance <laughs> uh I love how people are like, in retrospect, he's kind of awful. Grandpa Joe is the and funniest I'm like, character. Yeah, but dude. he's so funny about it. <laughs> he's making bad decisions in life, but he's being really funny. No, I was thinking about how smart Grandpa Joe is as a character, because um, otherwise you wouldn't get, like, it, it's a really smart way to have Charlie, like, do something bad in the factory without making Charlie out to yeah. be, like, a spoiled kid, you know? Yeah. I, but, yeah. Grandpa Joe, great performance. <laughs> yeah, I just love his performance, yeah. and I especially with performances want to talk about the singing. Oh my god! Because another thing that's very <laughs> interesting about when you watch this, uh, and it's another thing that really bothered me about Charlie and the Chocolate oh Factory, uh, but something that's very interesting that's unique about this, that mm -hmm. when you watch it, that I think, again, really leads to its atmosphere of kind of this very real, like realistic feeling kind of thing, like tangible feeling thing. Like the factory is, that's a word I would use for it. Very tangible, even if it's yeah. not. It feels very fantastical, but also like you could reach out and touch it, you know? Yeah, and, the, and these, ca like the cast choices, they feel very tangible. They're mm -hmm. not cartoonish portrayals of any of these characters. They feel yeah. like people. Sometimes people doing funny bits. Well, I mean, they're, they're people who live in a wacky world. Yeah. But they do feel like people. <laughs> and one of the interesting things you get with that, that plays into that, is the singing. And the singing is... <laughs> It's on a, is it's on dicey a, sometimes. It's on a, on a, like, a, a, a real metric. If you were ranging how well they sung, they sing terribly. <laughs> Most of them cannot sing. I swear, the pitch, the pitch is so, it's so off by, like, just a little bit a lot great. of the time. It's so great. <laughs> I think that's the best thing that could ever happen to this movie. It really, it really makes it feel a lot more 
authentic, yeah. which is crazy. It I feels so down to earth, and it feels like these like these people are really it, living in yeah. a musical. Like it's not it's not like a Broadway musical. It mm-hmm. feels like this weird, crazy, wacky world where people can also break into song. I think it's really funny that the one time Willy Wonka sings and it's not like a musical number, they're like, he's singing. Right, he's like, he's singing, this is kind of <laughs> weird. and this is crazy, yeah. <laughs> Which is really fun, I like yeah. that moment. But even like, I've got a golden ticket. Oh my god! Like, gosh. such an iconic I song. I forgot how like, magical, magical that song is, and it's so well shot. Yeah, very so well, well shot edited. and well staged and edited. Oh my god! And one thing that's really stand out to it, and, and I thought about this, that... I probably would never have actually <laughs> thought this while watching it if mm-hmm. they had done like Broadway style singing mm-hmm. with this. But I guarantee that if I had watched this version and then watched a version with this Broadway style singing almost, <laughs> I would be like, no, the, this version's better. Hearing <laughs> off pitch Charlie sing with his grandpa, it feels like a grandpa and their right? in, in their grandkid. Like singing and dancing even if that man. doesn't make sense it makes sense emotionally in like it doesn't Absolutely. make logical sense it makes sense emotionally and performance wise for these characters no it, it makes the atmosphere of the movie a lot more uh, again tangible is a really good word for it i was about to say one of one of the things i really honestly just hate about charlie and the chocolate factory is its songs mm. its songs are so I, annoying and poppy i don't mind the songs but over I, digital yeah i don't like how like digital and like sleek i i mean this is really a criticism of the whole movie i don't like how digital and sleek it is because it just doesn't mesh well with the kind of underdog scrappy tone of you know the book <laughs> but the songs in general and charlie just Nah. they're just bad in my opinion i mean I, I yeah in the context of the movie yeah I'd in the context sure of that. the movie in the context of like charlie and the chocolate factory yeah. as a story they're they're weird they don't fit anything <laughs> that that movie has so, that many, movie problems. Has so many problems so many problems but like man every single number in this is so interesting mm-hmm. and like you get a lot of very interesting it's spellbinding man yeah you get a lot of very interesting staging and mm-hmm. stuff too like pure imagination <laughs> uh, the classic song Everyone that's what a lot of people remember this movie for yeah um, is that sequence the staging of the walking down the stairs when he's stopping them from going <laughs> too far ahead of him or yeah. anything it's really like it's just engaging like I know some people who it call has that song slow, you know? but it's got so much personality yeah. and it's so engaging, and I I I can't look away when they're walking <laughs> up and down those stairs, right. and he's whacking, and you're like, oh man, he almost murdered that child, <laughs> dude. When he swings the cane up, he's like inches away from the one child's face. I'm like, dude, what was what was going on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was about to say, good thing they got the choreography of this right. Right. The timing. Oh my goodness. But, but yeah. Oh my goodness. But it's, so many elements of that go into that, and and there are a lot of other elements where they used a lot of practices of seventies like kind of filmmaking at the time too. Like they did a lot of stuff where like. When Gene Wilder first came out, like he, nobody else had seen him as Willy Wonka yet. So mm. all of their reactions to him hobbling along was like legitimate. They I were love like, that. That was weird. like a term of his contract. If he got to do the movie, he had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and like the, uh, oh, why did I just lose the name of it? The vehicle. Oh, uh, pff, I just lost I the name. I can't think of the, the soap vehicle. Yeah. The, uh, they the didn't, bubbles. They didn't tell people that the bubbles <laughs> were going to pop out, so their reaction would be genuine. And then that accidentally cost the production a lot of money. <laughs> and, you know, injured the actors. And because cause it injured the actors, because they <laughs> blasted soap into their faces without telling them. Because it was the 70s. Yeah. Because it was the 70s. But even with that in mind, like a lot of those elements also play to that kind of feeling that this movie has of just being tangible Mm -hmm. everything about this movie feels real while never feeling real well yeah that's what that's part of what makes the magic of the movie really work and the whimsy of it really work is that it feels very real yeah even the inventing room everything there's nothing and authentic i think is a better word for it yeah even in the inventing room despite like the (laughs) gobstopper machine being covered up like everything like you can see it Mm -hmm. you can see everything moving even if you don't like even if it's clearly not real you always get you always get um like an abstract idea of how everything works like the movement or in color yeah one of my favorite scenes of the factory stuff is uh like it's not one of my favorite overall scenes Mm -hmm. but just an interesting scene 
in terms of seeing the factory is the uh, gum machine, the machine that makes the gum. <laughs> when they're pouring out the juices. Because it's, it's, it's such a cool machine. And you can see it doing all of these different functions that make no sense to be together no in sense. one machine. <laughs> But you can see it. You can yeah. see the machine operate. It's very tangible. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, this is how it's working. Well, it, it feels like, um, again, it, it makes logical, it makes like logic, like child logic sense with how a lot of these machines are designed. You yeah. Know? In the same way, like being able to watch him go around and he like puts the <laughs> shoes in his yeah. little candy bag, like that is like the same feeling mm -hmm. you get. You feel like you're watching the factory. Yeah. Oh, and that's and that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's I, I it's spellbinding is a really good word for it. I think. Yeah, I would agree because it's so it's so gripping and it's so whimsical and wonderful. Yeah, it's, well, it's probably, like it's whimsical <laughs> in a way that's really tangible, mm -hmm. and that's kind of like the the mess like like the takeaway of the movie. The thing that makes it special to me is it's. Is it how tangible it is and how whimsical it is. Yeah. Uh, and, a, and a blending that I don't it's think amazing, I've ever man. seen anything else pull off. <laughs> but we haven't talked about something, Ravi. <laughs> okay. We haven't talked about the fact that this is like the funniest movie ever made. It's so funny. Um, it is a comedy at the end of the day. Do you have do you have a favorite like comedic scene, <laughs> oh sequence, gosh. joke? There's so many funny ones. Um, basically anything... Um, with Mr. Salt is like the funniest <laughs> thing ever. There's, I love Mr. Okay, Salt. Actually, funniest thing to ever happen maybe in a movie ever is um, the police officer <laughs> giving the news to the wife <laughs> of a kidnapped husband <laughs> that the kidnappers are demanding their last box of Willy Wonka chocolate bars. <laughs> I was about to say, so... so That whole sequence is to, so funny. I've seen this oh movie countless times, like literally probably <laughs> countless times yeah um and i used to watch this on <laughs> dvd yeah we used to little, watch it on our little dvd on a little player. uh cd like dvd player a portable, the DVD, portable player. dvd player and i think it was a piece of there garbage. was <laughs> like i could tell you my favorite sequence because i can tell you the chapter title on the dvd of my favorite it's sequence quite funny. the chapter title of it is simply titled wonka mania wonka mania the, the wonka mania, mania sequence which goes from the report of the first child finding the ticket <laughs> Uh, to the end of all of that. It's so funny. It's so oh my gosh. Um, There's so many good bits in that. Just in that short little Like, it's range. just, like, it's going for it's comedic like bits. like whole minutes, too. Yeah, it's going for comedic bits that are just, that are just straight up funny. The kind of stuff that, again, you don't really see in quote-unquote, like, You don't get like, those in comedies nowadays. Or comedies in yeah. general now. Like, it's, it's good 70s style comedy. Yeah. Um, and, like, dude, the computer thing. <laughs> the super computer. I am now telling the computer that if it tells me where the gold ticket is, it will gladly share with it the, the grand, grand prize. prize. I <laughs> like, swear. The performances, the timing, <laughs> the fact that they're all, like, just good throw, throwaway There's bits. There's so many just amazing throwaway bits. <laughs> there are many, many more important things. I can't think of I any. I can't think of any right now. <laughs> but I'm sure there I'm are. Sure there's <laughs> <laughs> like it's just it's just really funny. I crack up for and that's just the, the the beginning of the movie. You know, it's funny, I was reading through um the Wikipedia page and it mentioned that there was a deleted scene that Mel Stewart like loved. Like it was his favorite scene that they shot for the movie, and it was another bit like that, um, where this person is like climbing up this like high extremely high mountain to meet with this monk who's living on the top of the mountain <laughs> they ask him what the meaning of life is and he, he's like can i have a wonka bar <laughs> and he, like the monk opens it and he, there's no golden ticket he's like life is disappointment <laughs> or something like that and i'm Dude, like oh it's my so gosh. good <laughs> an archangel came to me and whispered oh me the location of all the gold tickets <laughs> the archangel therapist scene is so funny there's oh. there's just uh, basically every bit in that entire sequence which it's like a it's like a 20 minute sequence i think yeah, of it, all the kids like finding the bars and like people trying to find the bars 
it's it's just like one of the funniest, most engaging parts. And of the it movie. also does a really, really good job of of again setting up that kind of whimsy, mm-hmm. that very real. It feeling establishes whimsy. the universe a lot um, too. Like with each individual kid, you get you get like a goose this soon, and you get like the dad <laughs> eating the microphone. That's one of the most and baffling like, beats in any movie like ever. He, I think. Like every time I look at it, and I'm like, how does he do? He just eats the microphone. <laughs> he just leans over and bites the top of the microphone off. <laughs> it's so funny. It's so. It funny. Makes no sense, but it's a great moment. It's like the funniest thing to ever happen, probably. And it's like so much stuff like that is just (laughs) packed into every single reveal, Mm -hmm. every single ticket reveal, every single filler bit in between. And like they all feel, again, really super tangible. The thing that makes that bit funny is that that just looks like a microphone. Like every time I look at it really closely, that just looks like the top of a microphone. Not even it like a foam, not even like a foam covering. That is just the top of a microphone. <laughs> it's so funny, dude. It's so good. And like the different performances of even when like uh, Violet gets her thing, like it's just funny <laughs> and it's good and it's engaging and it's fast paced enough throughout the beginning i was about not... to say the the first act it is either like very slow with the stuff with charlie or you get like the really fast stuff with like all of the people finding the tickets and the wonka mania stuff dude which works really his, well his teacher <laughs> His, Charlie's classes. The Charlie's classes. That, that's the funniest stuff in the world. It's so funny. And it has no reason to be. You could be lame, like some kind of, just throwing a name out there, Tim Burton. Oh my gosh. And have none of that. You're never going to let Tim live this I one will, down. It's one of the, the biggest things I hate about his career is that he made that movie. Aw. Um, I mean, fair. But. but like, you could be like Tim Burton and have no school for Charlie. Because why throw in school for Charlie? There's Who no cares? reason to. But instead, we have two scenes of Charlie's school, and they're the funniest things so in funny, the world. Dude. They have, like, the greatest comedic actor of all time play his teacher, just spouting these lines that just are absolutely, absolutely hilarious as a teacher. It's the funniest thing. <laughs> of course you don't. If you knew and I didn't, you would be teaching <laughs> the be teacher. Teaching. And for a teacher, a student to, to teach, teach the teacher, teacher would be presumptuous <laughs> and rude. <laughs> like, it's just, it's it's good. <laughs> and his performance, like, I can even quote the lines, and it doesn't, it doesn't even capture how it's funny... So funny. Funny. this guy is there's just there's so many like just f- hilarious implied bits of like uni- in universe stuff in this movie it's so funny <laughs> i don't i honestly don't understand how they made this movie and it turned out so good even even the interactions later on between the different parents yeah, once in, they the make it in the factory are hilarious it's so funny they're just little faces <laughs> at each other and they're like interaction it's so good Oh my uh, again, Salt especially is one mm-hmm. of the funniest consistently throughout <laughs> of just like his different reactions and comments to things. No, I was watching um, a lot of the like parents performances like in the background, even when they don't have lines, They're, just their expressions are so funny. <laughs> I, I still really love the the uh, so like I'm a geography teacher. Oh, so you know oh, so all you about know. Loompa. You must know all about Loompa. And, and, and she's like terrible. She's like still <laughs> shaking her head, and then she like stops. And there's like what? Oh my gosh, the Loompa Land. <laughs> uh, like I said, best version of the Oompa Loompas exists. Indeed, in I this love movie. these Oompa Loompas. And their songs too. I was I was really scared that the Oompa Loompa stuff was gonna age like terribly, but it actually seems like the best way you. Could I was about to say again, it. instead of making it a weird race, instead thing, of making it like a weird, they're race these thing, weird wacky orange like, face guys with green hair. Yeah, I was about to say they make them so cartoonishly like, and they and obviously they're very happy. Like that's their whole bit is that they're very happy with what they do. <laughs> Yeah, and they have, in in general, there's a lot better characterization of them Mm -hmm. in this than in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, where for some reason, they seem very subservient. Not only that, but they're all played by one actor, which is weird. Yeah. It's the entire vibe around the Oompa Loompas. I hate their songs in Charlie, (laughs) but the entire vibe around them in general, I don't like. Well, I was just talking about the the book. Compared to the book, they seem very, like, more in servitude to 
Willy Wonka, which in this one, they just seem like kind of chill employees. More right, than like, he, like he brought them there and then they're just kind of like hanging out. Dude, like, any of like, the lines. I was about to say, they, they do a lot them. of lines and stuff to make it that way. Yeah. Like the, no, I won't hold it no, against you personally. I won't hold it against you personally. I won't hold you personally accountable. <laughs> like it's so funny, dude. It's like there are good yeah. stuff with good characterization of the Oompa Loompas, mm-hmm. even though they don't get much individually. And but you're the, right. The musical and their songs, their songs amazing the lyrics like a the, the, the little lyrics, floating lyrics yeah like they, they get a lot of they have a lot of fun like cards and stuff that yeah. are just absolutely out there something that you would not see in a movie nowadays and it works it, so well <laughs> I, I love i love how you just get like it really it's like a minute long shot of just a static frame of the shoot like the egg shoot with little <laughs> lyrics like slowly right. rippling up onto the screen and that rocks it's so good it's yeah. so engaging and interesting and good to look at <laughs> yeah no, dude it's great <laughs> what like it's I, I can't even i can't even think of a problem with this movie <laughs> the only problem I, i've honestly, ever heard yeah. somebody even complain about that i'm like oh yeah is that like cheer up charlie is like 30 seconds too long i think cheer up charlie is a verse too long i feel like they should either, yeah they should have either made the like verses said, a bit quicker cheer up or charlie is like 30 seconds too yeah. long but even then that's it's it. not i remember it's funny because i remember watching it with it as a kid and we used to as like everyone has stories of doing when everyone they watched it this, as a kid yeah. that we used to skip cheer up charlie skip cheer up charlie because um, i used to think this was like the longest thing in the world and well, i watch it now and i'm like yeah it's a little too it's long it's a bunch <laughs> of wide shots of charlie walking and the mommy cheer with up wrong charlie. dissolves of <laughs> charlie's mom be sad. saying charlie don't be sad everything you have lots to hope will for. be okay <laughs> yeah. if you are glad exactly it's not even the lyrics but it could be i don't know and it's like that for like a minute and a half or two minutes <laughs> which i think it works fine yeah no it's not even it's bad fine. it's just a little too long that's the only thing <laughs> man it's just compared to how electric all of the other songs are and like how like gripping all of but the again, other songs I, I, are. I especially like that this movie takes its time mm-hmm. especially with its outside atmosphere like, no it's very like refreshing the I town think. and everything feels no, all very... the townspeople and like just the general atmosphere yeah, and the like, locations and yeah. everything they feel very tangible very real and very kind of they dirty feel like they have a lot of personality yeah to them, which is again uh, for some reason very rare to find in uh, not only kids movies just movies in general a lot of the time or maybe nowadays. even some other adaptation <laughs> <laughs> where everything feels weirdly sterile it's... and like that it's they're living in a fake world where they are not only it's so strange not only extremely out so of strange. place but also it just doesn't feel real <laughs> it's very it's very digital burton in in that version of the story and whereas, not in a good way whereas this feels like a like a little small european town like a nice like corner of the world yeah kind where of everything's almost, a little wacky yeah like <laughs> like it, it almost feels like a kind of a forgotten corner of mm-hmm. the world despite willy wonka's factory being in their town <laughs> right no, I was I was trying to figure out like um because you asked you mentioned I don't know like, where they're the canonically end. supposed to be yeah no um because I was like well where is the movie supposed to be set and they shot mostly in just like different locations in like Germany I was about to say because they're Austria, not in America and, like they there's a bunch they shot on a bunch of different European countries so I assume the idea is to it's set somewhere in Europe quote, well that's unquote. that's that would make sense yeah. too because that's like there's a lot of the British chocolate people. Well, the chocolate like yeah, capitals the chocolate, of the yeah. world are like and like germany and belgium exactly and yeah. like different and and like clearly if you look at this town and you know anything about architecture <laughs> that is a european it's town very european, a western yeah. european town yeah um but yeah no best i could track down was somewhere in europe <laughs> <laughs> um but i i think it's a really a, a really smart way to establish like the world of like this story because uh, charlie's like poverty isn't meant to be like suffocating in, yeah in that it's way to, it's, it's a poor town yeah it's, it's not even just it's it, yeah it's meant to be more like as scrappy than sad yeah I like think. It, like just outright again sad. In, in, a, in a weird moment in <laughs> for an example of this in charlie and the chocolate factory uh Dude, the, the world house. looks the world looks pretty normal like t- t- today normal <laughs> like there are like nice apartments very like 80s it's so built weird. kind of houses yeah um 
which are most of our modern like houses that we think of were built in the 80s and it very much feels like it, it's post that architecture yeah and then you have the bucket's house which is this weird cartoonishly like cartoonishly falling cart- apart yeah cartoonishly like falling house. apart no it's like wooden is it wood yeah it's oh like made gosh. out of wood it's like weird like almost like gothic style architecture of course and it's just standing in the middle of this half open snow plot yeah it's really weird it's bizarre and it feels completely out of place from anything else in the world and you're like wow they specifically are, are super so poor, poor. <laughs> they're so poor yeah you get <laughs> instead of instead of wow this is kind of a poor town yeah you get a, more of an idea again i i think this is tied a lot to like economic recession times in its text yeah um which I think is a really smart way to do it. I was about to say, a town where so many people are struggling, mm-hmm. and specifically Charlie's family, yes, is struggling more than most a little of more, the town. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you have all of these other countries, people from these different countries who are just absolutely fine, <laughs> better than fine, right? living way beyond their means. I was about to say, living, living not the American their means, dream living a way lot beyond, of the time. Like, charlie's imaginable dream yeah i was about to say like any of these kids lives would be charlie's like wildest dream you the know? fact yeah like and you have and, and that plays into the central mm-hmm. theme of the story yeah. the fact that you have like augustus the a kid who <laughs> just like it eats and eats, eats and eats and eats yeah. because he can because he can exactly it, whereas charlie can barely get food at all <laughs> And somebody who spends all of his time in front of the TV mm-hmm. because he can versus somebody who has to spend all of his free time either at school or working to help support his family. Yeah. Or and you and you can just go through the list of even Violet, who is like always the weakest, like bad thing. <laughs> I She's was just about rude. Say, I was about to <laughs> say Violet just she can indulge she all of habits. her bad habits. Exactly. Yeah. Like she has the ability to indulge all of her bad habits with almost no repercussions. Whereas Charlie doesn't, Charlie doesn't even have the means to do any of his <laughs> right. bad habits. Right. Yeah. And then you, of course, Veruca. Oh, I man. feel like Veruca is always the easiest one to shoot down. At any of the kids. But you have all of these, you have all of these kids <laughs> yeah. who can, who, who getting a lifetime supply of chocolate really wouldn't, wouldn't change much. Yeah. That different. I mean, heck they, again, They went through a lifetime, like Veruca's family and their company (laughs) went through a lifetime supply of chocolate just looking for the golden ticket. ticket. Yeah. No, it's the way they the way they write and frame Charlie's like journey in this movie is so brilliant. Well, but it it also makes like his town feel like an Mm -hmm. integral part of of where Charlie grew up. It's an important location. I was about to say it feels important that we know where he came from And and that he's close to the factory. Exactly. Yeah. That no, he grew up next to the factory. It's such a, like I said, it's one of the most smart adaptations you could do of this book into a movie because it captures so much of the spirit of exactly. the book and also manages to make so many like brilliant changes that make the movie work so much better while you're watching right. it. This movie is just throwing stuff out there <laughs> that help make it feel more like what it's going for. Like mm-hmm. at the beginning of the movie. They're like, hmm, we want to kind of look at Willy Wonka's factory, but we kind of want it to be kind of like foreboding. We want it to be a little, a sense of danger the that tinkerer, will come later. Like a, and you have this guy the roll tinkerer, up. tinkerer, yeah. He's not a tinkerer. No, that's, that's he, the, but, what is, what is, what is the name of that? Yes, but he's not a tinker. He rolls up and it's just a, a wagon of <laughs> sharp objects and knives. No, I looked this up. I was like, what is his profession supposed to be? But it's, he, I, I don't remember if tinker is the name for it, but it's, it used to be a job where he'd go where people would go around and fix other people's um like household appliances and like you know like their spoons and spatulas and pans and stuff like that that's what he's supposed to be yes but he but still in the movie he just rolls up (laughs) with a cart full of knives like cleavers and saws (laughs) yeah and says something very the most cryptic yeah i was about to say very like foreboding like riddle about the fact (laughs) <laughs> nobody ever comes like it's he does so like funny, a little dude. thing that you can hardly track what he's saying at first if you're not paying close attention and then he's like nobody goes in nobody comes out it's and it does so such a good job man. of setting the tone for the fact that maybe this factory isn't just whimsical mm-hmm. but also kind of dangerous yeah which leads to like half of the kids getting like essentially killed no i think it's really interesting how much uh, like physical danger is a part of this movie because like obviously you get like the kids slowly dying in the factory um but also you get like slugworth and everything like he feels very physically imposing whenever he's there yeah dude the way he shot 
<laughs> Dude, they do like wide lens close up on the guy who plays <laughs> Slugworth. And he's just like, it's so his good. face is filling the screen it's so for, good. for his entire little spiel. It's so funny. I swear. Everything about this movie is just fantastic. It's amazing. It's it's immaculate. All well of it. Directed, all man. of it plays into it's it, so the well themes shot. and atmosphere. Yeah. All of it is just it's just good. It's a it's I I said in my um review this time that it was like one of the most wonderful movies I know of, and I I would stand by that. Yeah. It's just <laughs> it's movie magic. Yeah. And man, again, it feels so it, it feels so nice to watch a movie in with how cynical a lot of the um, landscape of media is in general right now, which, you know, rightfully so <laughs> um, it which, you know, we're kind of getting a resurgence of like feel good movies again, yeah. um, which a lot of people are really grabbing onto. But it feels really nice to just watch like a straight up like be a good person and you will be rewarded kind like of a, like a like a like paddington 2 exactly. is a modern day kind of this yeah. movie like it's it's just it's a very like affirming movie you're like maybe if everything's gonna be okay kind of thing right like and, and maybe I, your wildest dreams will come true paddington you know? 2 is actually a pretty good example <laughs> of that specifically yeah. not even just on like a direct theme of if you're kind and polite the world will be mm-hmm. right but like just in general, Paddington Two operates on doing a lot of the things that this movie does yeah. well. It's kind of kind of a wacky world, but also like things are a little scary sometimes. And very know? and it's very tangible, yeah. despite you know being what it is. And yeah. it's a yeah, Paddington Two, great movie. Paddington Two, <laughs> phenomenal movie. <laughs> also has uh, like a ra- like a random musical number oh, too. So. Yes, <laughs> dude, I I love this movie so much. <laughs> The rain, rain on the, the roof, go pity pan. <laughs> I swear, go watch Paddington too if you haven't seen it. Go watch by the way. <laughs> Willy Wonka first. Though. Dude, watch Willy Wonka, then Paddington too. The um, double the, feature it. The Blu-ray that I got, the Blu-ray release for this looks pretty good. Pretty I gotta good, say, pretty good. <laughs> but yeah, uh, do you have anything else to add? Anything, anything else to, add? to comment? Really, Questions, concerns. Really, the big thing that I wanted to make sure I mentioned was um the the Wonka Mania sequence Wonka Mania because that really it's so it's so so good though right. I don't want to even say that the movie peaks there but it kind of does well like it peaks like comedically yeah there, it, I would oh say. it's definitely but the that's, funniest but that's part even of the movie. just like a precursor to the rest of the movie exactly yeah like it, it, like nonstop mm. every single one of those bits is fantastic you could watch any <laughs> single one of them out of context and I would be so like this funny. is great yeah. Um, so but yeah, man. That that was the, the that was the big thing. I just it, it's it's really just an amazing movie, and I it inspires me to this day, you know. And I you know I'm a big Roald Dahl fan. It's I like I said, it's very close between this and Fantastic Mr. Fox for the best Roald Dahl movie adaptation. See, I would say <laughs> that I would hold them pretty close on equal ground for mm-hmm. quality as of a movie. movie. Yeah, as a but movie. But I would still say that I think this movie, to me personally, captures. Like Roll Doll in an adaptation a lot better. Yeah, I just don't, I don't, that's like, true. You don't Fantastic get Mr. Fox is a great, fantastic, practically yeah. perfect movie, but it just doesn't. It doesn't make me think. Oh yeah, Roll Doll. I love that author. Well, it it operates on a lot of the same like logic and emotional beats as most of his books do, but it's more about like midlife crisis stuff yeah. than it is about childhood. It's stuff. a very. It's a very like. Even though it's still a kids' movie, it's a very adult adaptation of one of Roald Dahl's stories. Yeah, it's more of a it, it's more like a Roald Dahl book. I've always th- thought of Fantastic Mr. Fox as more of like a Roald Dahl book for like people coming of age. You know, this kind of recontextualizes like mm-hmm. a lot of the messages to be more. I don't know. To be more, you know, meditative than a lot of his books usually are, because usually his his stories are just about children getting out of oppressive. Uh, dynamics somehow or uh, cross apartment turtle <laughs> or cross relationships. apartment turtle romance <laughs> exactly which are pretty great I love you see our <laughs> but yeah no I, I I really do think it would be so close I don't know if I could pick <laughs> but yeah no fantastic movie indeed we'd love to see it <laughs> again I gave it a five out of five I also gave it a five out of five if you haven't uh, watched it please go watch it stop stop the podcast what are you doing Go listen to it. <laughs> Go watch it. I Go on. I was about to say, just listen to it. I, I mean, mean, the soundtrack, the album's pretty, pretty good. I, I gotta admit. <laughs> but yeah, go watch it. Yeah, go, go watch go it. Go do that. Um, okay. And then come back. Then come back for our what we watched segment, which we're about to get into. <laughs> Indeed. All 
All right, so for those of you who are new to the podcast or have just never made it this far, uh, the What We Watch segment is a fun little thing we do at the end where we talk about all the movies that we have seen since our last episode. Since last episode. We give brief thoughts, brief ratings, very brief, and we just, you know. <laughs> Stressing the, the brevity. Because sometimes it's not very brief. We try to be brief, <laughs> but sometimes it's not. Nice. Uh, but this isn't too bad. We, you know, if we do it on a consistently weekly basis like we're supposed to. <laughs> you don't get to, like this weird pile yeah, up of a we're bunch not of like, movies. We're not like we watched 37 movies <laughs> since the last episode or something. So uh, let's get into it, Remy. What did we start with on the second? Um, On the second, we went out to the theater, Micah. It went out to the theater. Well, the movie theater. The movie theater. <laughs> um, not like the title of this might lead you to believe. <laughs> it's called Spirited Away Live on Stage. Which is, a, again, a confusing title <laughs> when we're not, like, you say that to somebody and you're like, oh, you watched, like, a stage production, no. a, a recording of a we stage We watched production. the recording of the Spirited Away uh, live stage show, which yeah. is very cool. Very, very cool. It's a musical I was, now. I was really, well, yeah, I was very excited yeah. for it. Um I really wanted to catch it. This was actually the last day you could catch it in theaters. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was part. I don't know if is it officially part of G Fest. Yeah, or was it just a special no? It's thing? it's part of G Fest. Cool. Yeah. Um, but man, what a cool stage show! <laughs> it's it's so cool. It's it's amazing. Honestly. It's kind of it, even even <laughs> if it, even if I have some some slight adaptational problems with it. Yeah, and the fact that like I don't think it fully works. I don't know, but I, mean, I don't think it fully works by itself. Yeah. Like with no, like as with a no standalone spirited away, work, it would be yeah. kind of confusing. A little confusing, um, yeah. But like beyond that, it's one of, it's just so impressive. I don't care what you think about like theater it's or crazy, even the story dude. of Spirited Away. This is an impressive stage show to watch play out. I mean, it's a very technically impressive show. And I, I think say, honestly, the adaptational, like the way it adapts the movie I don't, I honestly don't understand how they did it. It's it such, like it, it does a really brain. it does a really really good <laughs> job of of understanding it emotionally mm-hmm. of doing the pacing well. That's that's of, what it was so crazy, dude. Like and it, and it's <laughs> and it follows like there was like no changes to how the story plays out essentially. You know, honestly, I think like if if you're looking to just experience the story of Spirited Away, I think this is pretty much on par with the movie. Um, obviously Again, there's, there's, bits, I disagree I, I, just because it doesn't work yeah. without the movie. I think that on a technical level, the movie's a bit more impressive, um, just cause I think it's a really well directed and well crafted movie, um, and you know, visually striking, but as but a, this like, is crazy as a stage play, I honestly can't imagine a better version of this. I can't. Right. It, dude, it's the, like perfect. The, the staging and the sets and the costume work and the prop work, dude. No face when he gets full, like false. I did. That's I just, crazy. I was just blown away, and it's movie like not. It's like it's stage just brilliance because it's you can amazing. you can clearly tell what they're doing to do these effects, mm-hmm. but it still is it like works so it's well. so engaging. Yeah. You don't even think about it. You don't think like, oh, look at like that's like five people under a sheet. You're like, whoa this is cool (laughs) yeah you're like that is a towering like figure (laughs) on the stage (laughs) but anyway i think it's i think it's practically perfect for what it is and even beyond that i think it's an achievement of art and stage production it's i give it a five it's pretty well shot too like we're talking mostly about the stage show itself it as a as a recording of a stage show it's pretty engaging i gotta say yeah um, but yeah, I, I also gave it a five out of five. Love that little model train they had. The going little train, the yeah. <laughs> any of the any of the tiny like any time they would use like the little up close stage cam with like the ultra wide lens, it was so funny. <laughs> uh, then on the third, I watched uh, the Nice Guys. The Nice Guys. Shane Black. Shane Black. Weird guy. Uh, I was I'd been, I'd I'd heard great things about this big Ryan Gosling. Are they band. are they nice guys, um, Micah? I haven't seen the movie. Yeah, they're yeah, they're pretty nice, relatively. <laughs> but uh, dude, this is this is really really good. I don't know how it's so good because it's kind of stupid and like the plot is kind of stupid, but like it's so funny and it's so much fun and the dynamic between Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling is fantastic nice. and honestly the biggest highlight here is really just that this is probably like the best performance i've ever seen Ryan Gosling give i mean he's such a good actor but he hardly ever gets to like let loose right he, you know? he's so expressive in this <laughs> and he's like his his just different noises that he makes and faces and the amount of not only that like emotion he conveys through his character his character is just so interesting and funny to watch nice it's it's 
he's fantastic <laughs> in this. Also, he looks amazing in this. The costume design and makeup and hair, they were they were going crazy. I I really liked this a lot. It's not my favorite thing in the world, it, dude. but it's really really fun. I wish it was a little more like kind of punchy, mm. more poppy. But interesting. Uh, yeah. Still very very good. Uh, I give it a four and a half out of five. Very cool. I can't, people get on, keep getting on to me for not seeing the nice guys yet when I'm such a big comedy fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on the third, I watched a film called Hundreds of Beavers, which I figured we could just yeah, talk about now. Then on the fourth. Because I also rewatched it on the Then he fourth. watched it with me. <laughs> so we watched Hundreds of Beavers, yes. uh, which you should watch. You, you have personally to, have to go track If, if our down, voice please. is hitting your ears... You hundreds are contractually beavers. obligated to go out and watch Hundreds of Beavers. It's called Hundreds of Beavers, and it's maybe the greatest film of our lifetime. <laughs> um, it's so... This is a very cool film. Yeah. I can't, I can't even... Like, we could do a whole episode on this. I actually oh, thought about suggesting it, but I didn't really have, have a chance to, to watch it, it yeah. a second time. Um, but this is a so impressive movie. It looks, <laughs> sounds... It's squeak in the chair. <laughs> it looks and sounds like it would just not work at all. Right. It looks like it, this cheap kind of garbage looking movie. <laughs> and like you're like, wow, it's a bunch of people in animal costumes. This is weird. <laughs> but somehow it it turns into like this weird, engaging Looney Tunes esque. It really is a, sprawling. It's an hour like and a half long Looney Tunes bit. Yeah, essentially. It's, it's, it's a live action Looney Tunes cartoon. <laughs> yeah. And like in the best in the way. best way. Yeah. Like it's crazy the stuff they pull <laughs> off. And honestly, I think it's really technically impressive. It's insane. The combination impressive. of fake and real that they do that obviously like you can tell ever anything that's digital and fake in yeah. this very easily. They use like dot PNGs for some of the things. <laughs> But that's part of the charm of its aesthetic. But it does a really good job of actually blending those in a way that by the end of the movie just feels so natural. I was about to say. And it also look pretty good. Yeah, it incorporates them in a very naturalistic way. And, like, it's part of the aesthetic. It's not, like, a limitation of its aesthetic. Exactly. Know? Like, dude, take, like, anything in the beaver, like, complex is <laughs> that's so cool. crazy. Like, the entire chase <laughs> is pretty much a cartoon chase sequence with, human characters over the entire cartoon landscape it's crazy dude i honestly um prefer this to something like who framed roger rabbit it's obviously a very different kind of movie but if we're talking like real life cartoons that sort of thing <laughs> i hundreds of beavers is hard to beat man yeah this is it, it, it's really <laughs> really inventive and really really funny it's so funny. and has no like uh, like almost no spoken dialogue it's a silent right? film it's darn near, yeah i was about to say on a technical level there's like no spoken dialogue um you get like an occasional exclamation or like a phrase yeah, or like, something oh, um, hmm? oh, hmm? yeah that's most of it <laughs> But it's 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 brilliant. I I beg you to go watch Hundreds of Beavers. <laughs> right, I'm do I yourself could you not a favor. Go watch Hundreds of Beavers. Yeah, uh, it still is not like a masterpiece in my opinion. I like think, it's it's pretty you know, technically crazy. Yeah, but it's it. I still have problems there's, with it. There's there's some like kind of weird. I'm beats. hyping this up this much because it's 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 impressive. It's it is an impressive. insane movie that yeah. I think you should go watch. But it's still not a perfect movie, in my opinion. <laughs> it's and pretty darn some, close. There's some pacing things and some yeah. weird beats here and there. Uh, I give it a four and a half out of five. I, I gave it a five out of five both times. I, I think it's phenomenal. I would it, I put it in my <laughs> top 250. It's, it's one of my favorite movies now. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, what, uh, what did you watch after that? Or you, no, you, you watch? Did, what did you watch what did after I that? Watch? Friday? I watched another. Actually, yeah, I was gonna say my last film of the Atlanta Film Festival, but not quite. Uh, there's one more after this. But I watched a movie called Red Earth, which is kind of like an experimental sci-fi movie that was kind of boring. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's kind of meant to be like this. There's like three different characters, and they're all like describing. Um, this like fallout earth had and they all did, had to like move to Mars. It's like three different generations, it, which it sounds like it would make a much better book than a movie, <laughs> honestly. Um, and I think that is the case. Uh, it just doesn't really grab me that well cinematically, which is a shame because I, I do like it a lot in theory. And a lot of it is like um, obvious. It's very low budget. A lot of it is like just talking head kind of things or one location with one guy. 
Um, so I don't know. I, I admire it more than I like it. Um, I don't think I'd ever really watch it again, but it was, it wasn't really all that egregiously bad. So I ended up giving it a three out of five. It's called Red Earth. Came out this year. Huh. Very interesting. Then what do we, then what do we tune into, Rebby? Um, on May the 4th. May, May 4th, we sat down and we finally got our parents to watch the last of the, uh, Skywalker saga, uh, Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, which they they hadn't seen up to this point. So yeah, but this was this was a the first re my first uh, this was viewing my second, since the theater. Yeah, I see. This was my third time seeing the movie. Mm. Um, a very odd movie. Very odd movie. And <laughs> it's it's still looks great. <laughs> dumb as rocks. Dumb as rocks. But I kind of enjoy that. It, it, I wish it was a little shorter so I could enjoy it more. Yeah, um, I wish if it was if it was like a half hour shorter, I would actually probably really like it. But it's it's the funny the funniest thing in the world <laughs> to me is that this movie is so long, and there's so much that it's rushing around to do. The first half of this movie it feels is like so rushed, it's like dude. breakneck speed, uh, but nothing really happens mm-hmm. in the whole movie. That's the thing; it goes so fast, but then there's like nothing happening for the whole movie. The entire movie really is just because because you open with Kylo going to Exegol, mm-hmm. so literally all it takes, and and you end the movie by. Kylo and Rey going to Exegol. It's so weird. That's like it. That's the bit. The only the only thing is now that the Resistance knows where Exegol is. You have a like two and a half hour it's long movie dude. of of just crap happening. Like literally just nothing. Just nothing, dude. Um, for so long, just to get to the end, and then you have the stupidest ending of it's all the time. Silly, the silliest uh, Star Wars movie, I think. It's so silly. And and not always in a good way. Usually, I would say silly, and I would be like, "Oh, that's that's something I like because I like when movies are silly." But this is just—it's so deeply just like flawed as a sequel to any of the Star Wars movies, really. Well, people people like to point out, yeah. and I think it's true that you know J.J. Abrams did the Force Awakens, and he had his ideas. I'm, but then, I'm not a Force Awakens guy but personally. Then, but then you know it was given to. Uh, Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson. And he tried to do something interesting. He tried with to it. do he, it. He tried to do something. Love it or hate it. <laughs> yeah. He was trying to do something he was trying to specific do something. with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then J.J. Abrams came back and was like, oh, I don't, mm. I don't know about all that. He just retcons and the whole then he movie. Retcon- essentially. Like, like essentially, yeah. Essentially, he is writing <laughs> episode two and three of this trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it just doesn't work for me it leave i i really want to buy into what it's selling and it just i it left me so cold both times i watched it i i still enjoy it i, I, don't, ga- I gave I don't it a like get really anything i enjoy out it. of it it but looks I, really good i more like enjoy the cinematography being, and the way the camera moves is amazing i, I love it i more enjoy just being like <laughs> this is kind of stupid and like enjoying so some of it's the fun so moments dumb. oh my goodness but you <laughs> they, do get oscar isaac they fly now they fly now <laughs> They fly now. <laughs> oh my goodness, man. But anyway, I gave it a two and a half. Yeah, I gave it a three because, like I said, I do admire its score. I don't think it's a two. I so admire its score. Yeah, don't give half I don't think ratings, it's a two. So. I admire its score. I admire its camera work. Um, and some of its performances are fun. But really, outside of that, I don't get much out of it. So I gave it a three out of five. Rise of Skywalker. Very weird. <laughs> very weird conclusion to a saga. <laughs> right. Uh, then on the fifth, the I fifth? watched... Drop Dead Gorgeous. Drop Dead Gorgeous. A, a cult classic, if you will. Another cult classic. My goodness. Um, I gotta watch that movie. <laughs> and it looks crazy. I really, really love a lot of what it's doing. I understand why it's a cult classic. The atmosphere is fantastic. Immaculate. The cast is crazy. There are even even the cast some, is the big reason I want to. There see are even it. some such really, fun really funny jokes and like great moments, and it's a cool concept. But I really did not find myself laughing at this too much because I just felt like a lot of the humor uh, did not work that well for me mm, personally. And shame. I know a lot of people who don't ag- do not agree with this at all. Um, <laughs> but as like a satire and a mockumentary, it, it goes for some things. Yeah. And which, you know, I applaud. Yeah, I applaud. For, I, for applaud I applaud this movie. <laughs> I think this movie is impressive on the fact that it goes for everything it possibly could. <laughs> like, literally, it just swings for the fences. Good. Good for it. <laughs> um, but a lot of the jokes 
make me way more uncomfortable than laugh. Ah. Like I just don't even think they're that funny written. Which like is even really even a if shame, they're yeah. even if they're about a subject or use terminology that I don't like, like this has a lot of slurs in it. Mm. Um it makes sense for there. Yeah, it makes sense for a nineties <laughs> yeah. comedy. It, it's not it's not that. It's that the like I mean, yeah, I don't like that, but no. it's not that alone. Uh, I also just don't think they're very well executed jokes. Like the entire joke is, look, it's this thing a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, so, it's very easy to make like a bigoted joke and not have a punchline. Yeah. For it, which, unfortunately. which are a lot of the jokes <laughs> yeah. in this movie. Like for a good portion of the movie, it's just those kind of jokes. And that really just makes me sad because like I just don't find that funny. Yeah. And I don't think it's it makes me uncomfortable. I don't like it. And like. Outside of that, that takes a big portion of the runtime. It's just throwaway jokes like man, that. I, 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 man, I really want to see it because I love mockumentaries and I love comedy and no, I love the cast. It's got so many great I ideas, see it. but it's at the same time it is woefully way too stupid. And oh. it's, comedy. it's comedy is just dumb, like like not. That's like a shame, man. Poorly written, dumb. It's almost <laughs> like it was written by somebody who wrote Shark Tale. Mm. Oh, wait, it is. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Not the biting satire of Shark Tale. <laughs> uh, anyway, the cast is still fantastic. Amy Adams, Brittany Murphy. Like, c- come on. You got <laughs> Kirsten Dunst. Like, yeah, this, yeah. Thing is, this thing is fantastically casted. And again, there's some really great stuff in there. Uh, but overall, it just was not for me. It's a shame. Uh, I gave it a three out of five. Also, I put at the top of my review that in retrospect, it's a very bad look to have only watched this movie because Amy Adams is in it, given her na- like her character in this movie. I can't, I can't believe you only watched it for Amy Adams, <laughs> Micah. It's not a great look. It's not, especially <laughs> not for this movie, man. Um, on the 6th, I watched a film called Miss Viborg, or Viborg, I think is how it's actually pronounced. Well, you watched the film. I did. You would know. <laughs> well, because I thought it would be Viborg, and then they say it, I think it's, I think they I do say a Viborg in the movie. Viborg. Yeah. Um, which, it was the last movie of the Atlanta Film Festival. Uh, for me, I, I attended virtually this year. It was my first year attending in any capacity. <laughs> um, but it was it was a fun way to end it off, I think. It's a really sweet movie. It's just not quite there enough to be a four for me. I ended up giving it a three out of five. Um, but I do really like it. I, I admire a lot of what it's trying to do. Um, I think its emotional core works surprisingly well, Um, but also it reminded me a lot of my grandma. So (laughs) (laughs) I I, that that was probably a big contributing uh, factor for me enjoying it. So I don't know. It was sweet, um, but not great. It was good, I think. Uh, I don't know if I would be like, oh, go out and watch it, but I really enjoyed it. So I I gave it a three out of five. Miss V Borg. (laughs) Nice, nice. Miss V Borg. Um, (laughs) (laughs) On the sixth, uh, I also watched something. What? Uh, I watched watched a movie, Mike. I watched Drive. (laughs) uh, Hit Ryan Gosling. I was about to say you crossed two big Ryan Gosling movies off your list. Um, weird movie um letterboxed core classic it's so weird that it is though like this is just a weird movie (laughs) like on a lot of levels stylistically it's weird emotionally it's weird it makes a lot of weird decisions uh its direction for its performers is very weird (laughs) like they're like everything about it is just kind of off in a way but it still works for me um i think it's a really neat movie i think what it's trying to do works pretty well uh, Ryan Gosling is fun in this, though coming off of watching The Nice Guys, which is like his most expressive role of all time, <laughs> uh, watching this, which is probably his least his expressive, expressive role of all time. Even more so than Blade Runner, man. Oh, dude, Blade Runner, he has like wells of emotion. Uh, in that his is eyes. true, yeah. And this, he's a very emotional. He is just blank face. Dang, bro. He is, all of the performances are very blank. And I think that's purposefully done by the direction. Maybe it's not. Maybe it was just bad direction. Just bad direction. But. I still think something like works with it. It's just very off-putting coming mm. off of the nice guys to watch this, uh, but it's still really fun. Mm. It's got some fun action. Uh, Driver is a fun character to watch his little story play out. Um, <laughs> I love I love how intimidating he can be, but at the same time, it's just it, it needs way more characterization of him for the story to actually work like it needs to. Um, so I don't know. Still really fun. 
I gave it a four out of five. You didn't give an extra half star for the silly bands, Mike. <laughs> no extra half star for <laughs> Carrie Mulligan's silly bands. I love Carrie Mulligan, man. <laughs> Great, stuff. crazy stuff. <laughs> Uh, then, what did we watch, Remy? Uh, on the 6th, we sat down and watched Something Wild. Well, what did we watch? We know that it was Something what? Wild, but what did we oh watch? Oh my gosh. It's the Jonathan <laughs> Demme movie from the 80s called Something Wild. Crazy movie. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. <laughs> I actually, in retrospect, one thing that I was thinking about this movie is it's got a really good sense of, like, romance. Mm-hmm. Like, on-screen, like very it's a very romantic movie it's a very romantic movie and that's one of the things i love about it oh it's honestly like my second or third favorite jonathan dem movie <laughs> it's, it's so it's so funny it's so engaging it's so funny and I it's wish, so gripping i wish it was a little better paced because like it drags in a couple places for me yeah but the performances are so good <laughs> it's got a great sense of like I don't know, just energy to its romance. Yeah. And even it's like more racy things, I think, are really done in, in a very engaging and yeah. like good way for the story. I was surprised at how well handled a lot of the um, like sex stuff in this is like portrayed and how yeah. a lot of the romance is portrayed. And especially in the finale, it's it comes across as very authentic and very... Um, I don't know what I don't romantic know what the word I'm searching is what I would say. Yeah, I guess romantic is a good word for it. But um, a very very classical feeling movie. Yeah, and Ray Liotta is really really <laughs> fun in this. Yeah, but I, again, there are just some things that I, I mainly the pacing and I, I guess part partially the finale. Yeah, I knew I knew the finale would bother you. Just the like, I like it, it just kind of it kind of <laughs> ends rather abruptly and in, in a not very satisfying way for the characters. Um, so that's whatever, but it doesn't really take that much away from it's the movie. It's a beautiful movie, movie man. Uh, I, I gave it, it a four and a half I out of five. I love it so much. It's so good. <laughs> um, I gave it a five out of five. This is my second time watching it. I wanted to show it to Micah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's beautiful. It's such a it's such a wonderful movie. Such a joyful movie. <laughs> you, get, you get the tiny little um, uh, <laughs> little America. <hats>. <laughs> <laughs> that sequence is so good. My goodness. Um, but yeah, we watched something wild. And on the 8th, I watched a Hungarian animated movie called Bubble Bath. Um, and it was very interesting. It's very surrealist, um, which is kind of what it's known for. Gasp. Um, <laughs> You're telling me Bubble Bath was surrealist? <laughs> I was really? about to say, I'll, most people know it because they're seeking out like surrealist uh, animation. Um, but it is a really good execution of that. It does. It, it feels very integral to the movie's text and identity. And I really like um, it's kind of like a conversational musical about like a bunch of different topics like politics and, um, you know, just social life and uh, I don't know, relationships. It's, it's a really cool movie on a conceptual level, and it's so much fun to watch. Um, its surrealist elements are used really, really well, and they're used like like the way they punctuate stuff, uh, especially the music, is really nice. Nice, um, it, fantastic movie. I loved it so much. <laughs> um, I want to watch it again, um, so like I can see now that I have like a full picture of what it's supposed to be and what it like is. I want to see it again and maybe bump it to a five. But for the moment, I gave it a four out of five. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Bubble Bath, amazing movie. Cool, I loved cool. it a lot. And then on the 8th, last night, uh, last we watched night. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yes, indeed. My first viewing in, I think, like five years? That's my estimate. I'm not <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but it's been I, a while. That was like my fourth time logging it on Letterboxd. Oh, so. wow, yeah. Well, you watched it a lot without me, I suppose. Yeah, and I mean, I've watched it countless times <laughs> not logging it, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Great, pretty, pretty solid week. Honestly, we got to see hundreds of beavers and Spirited Away live on stage, and something wild. Pretty, you know? pretty wild, Ruby. Pretty crazy. You got to see the nice guys too, and the nice guys, <laughs> and Drive. Yeah, a goofy, a goofy list of films for me. <laughs> right, spanning so many different like <laughs> eras, eras, and, and genres, and tones. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of comedies, though. I, I think it's very funny that we're going to have in our episode lineup Alien Cubed and then this. <laughs> like, the the most serious, 
like dark, edgy movie that you can get. I, again, I don't think it works fully, but you I don't know, think like, it's that serious. In, in aesthetics, a yeah. very, a very dark movie. Um, and then Willy Wonk. <laughs> <laughs> Quite good funny. stuff, good stuff. But yeah, thank, thank you for listening all the way to the end. Uh, go watch Hundreds of Beavers and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, and uh, Nice Guys or Something Wild if you are okay if you with are, the content. If you are okay with the content and Something <laughs> Wild and uh, Nice Guys, go watch them. Because I because they're very good comedies. There you go. Go watch a movie. Go watch a movie. Have a good time. Have a good time. And we'll catch you next week. And we'll catch you next week.